Well, how many of you would like to, let me, let me ask it like this. How many of you, when you pray, you sometimes, or even a lot of the time, have this vague feeling that there's still something lacking that you didn't do that you should have done, you know? You know, the devil does not want us to pray with confidence. He wants us to pray with fear and doubt and wondering and I used to have the exact same thing. As many years as I've been praying and will continue to pray, I used to have that feeling on a regular basis too. Well, you know, I should have said more. Or maybe I didn't pray about the right thing or maybe I just didn't say it the right way. And so a lot of times when I keep having a repetitive problem that I know according to the word is not right, you see, no matter how we feel, if what we feel is not in agreement with the word, then what we feel is wrong and the word is right. Amen? So, for example, if I ask God to forgive me for something I've done wrong and I still feel guilty, then I know that guilt is a lie. The Word of God is not a lie. Because if I've asked and received, then God is faithful. So no matter how I feel, the Word of God is what's right. And as long as we continue to live by our feelings and not even confront the lies of the devil, but just go around feeling that way, then the enemy is always going to have an upper hand. So I just decided, well, if I'm going to pray, then I'm not going to spend time after I pray feeling like my prayers were useless. So I want to get to the bottom of this and find out what's going on. One of the things that I felt like that God showed me was that I complicated it and that I thought that it depended on length of time or eloquence in what was said. But he taught me that prayer, effective life-changing, dynamic prayer can be so simple, just so amazingly simple. I have one great-grandchild, and he's, uh, I guess Jeremiah is about three, and um, his mommy one night had a real bad stomach ache, and she was laying in bed, kind of doubled up in pain, and he went over and laid his hand on her, said he was going to pray for her, and he said, Jesus, mommy, ouchie, amen. <laughs> but listen, she said she almost immediately, the pain stopped, and she started feeling better. Actually, I came to a point in my life at one time where God actually challenged me. He said, I want you to ask me for what you want and need with as few a words as possible. Hmm. Yeah, it's harder than you think. You know, it's, it's hard when you've done something wrong to say, Father, I'm so sorry. Forgive me for that. Thank you. No, we want to go on. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, please forgive me, God. Please, please, please forgive me. Oh, God, I've been so bad. Please forgive me, God. I promise I'll never do it again. Yes, you will. <laughs> don't even waste your time making promises you can't keep. You're better off to say, I'll definitely do it again if you don't help me. So why don't we learn that the power of prayer is not in how many words or how eloquent or how long, but I believe it's two things. I think it's Faith, do I believe that God hears me? Do I believe he cares about me and wants to be involved in my life? Well, I can't read the Bible and not believe that. And I think that prayer must be sincere. You're going to see in Scripture that the Bible says that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much, makes tremendous power available. I love that in the Amplified. When we pray, tremendous power, whoo, is made available. Tremendous power is made available. I already know that tonight I'm going to pray for people who have back problems. God's already put that on my heart. And so when we pray tonight, when I just stand up here and pray and we all agree, I mean, it's going to be better than any doctor's appointment. It could be better than the best visit to the best hospital. You know why? Because tremendous power is going to be made available but it's not just up to me. You're going to need to release your faith too and say, oh, I received that in Jesus' name. And then if you leave and you go, oh, well, nothing happened. 
You know where we usually lose our faith? That's why we're waiting. We can pray in such faith, and boy, we can get really excited and have faith when we see a manifestation, but we receive the promises of God, the Bible says, through faith and patience. And a lot of times we have to, to wait. And one of the things that I've learned to do during that waiting time is any time that doubt comes against me, I open my mouth and say out loud, I believe that God is working in my life right now. I believe that God is working in my life right now. And I'm going to give you some good scriptures to back these things up. But I believe it's just the simple faith. God hears me. He wants to help me. And also then just being sincere about what you're praying. And I think that takes focus. How many of you find it extremely difficult to even focus for 10 minutes in prayer? So this morning... I looked at my clock, it was 8 o'clock, and I, of course, you know, I'd been praying in and out here and there, you know, we, and that's good, God hears all that, you know, but I wanted to have 10 minutes of focused, uninterrupted prayer for this session this morning, and I had to really set my mind to do that and not let anything else get my attention. I think, to me, that's what fervent, effectual prayer is. Fervent doesn't have to be yelling, it doesn't have to be crying. You know, I read books about people who weep and cry in prayer, and I think that's marvelous, but I don't cry very easy. And so I'm sure hoping God answers my prayers if I don't cry. Amen? I think it's fervent, effectual prayer, sincere, focused prayer. When we pray, we are talking to God. So let's act like we're talking to God and not act the way we do when we're talking to somebody else that we we're giving them about 10% of our attention and something else, 90% of our attention. And so I want to share with you this morning, and first I called it reasons why prayers are not answered, but we can also call it ways to get your prayer answered. Either way, we're going to talk about prayer. Well, the first thing is, is you're not ever going to get an answer if you don't ask. So the first royal law of prayer is you have not because you ask not. Now, I just wonder how many people in here this morning or possibly people watching by television, you have tremendous needs in your life, but you're not asking. Maybe you're wishing. <laughs> well, I wish. And I tell this story pretty often because it amazed me, but it fits right into this teaching this morning, and this is just a great example. Met a woman in a department store, and she recognized me and, from TV, and so... We started chatting. Yes, she was a Christian. She'd been in this certain church for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. So I was just asking her questions about the department store. And you know, I said, do you guys work on commission or do you work on salary? And she said, well, we actually work on salary, but we do have a quota that we have to meet. And if we don't meet that quota, then we'll get a warning. And then if we still don't meet that quota, then we can actually lose our jobs. So to me, that's just a real easy fix because of what I've learned about the Word of God. So I said, well, why don't you just pray that God will give you favor so the people shopping here will come to you for their purchases? And she looked at me kind of like some of you are looking at me like, huh. Well, all I've been doing is just standing around being afraid I'm going to lose my job. And she looked at me and she said, well, would it be okay to pray for something like that? I said, honey, you can talk to God about anything and everything that concerns you. If I needed to meet my quota at work and all it was going to take would be for some of the customers to float over toward me, then why would I not ask God to send them in my direction? Well, what if that wasn't his will? Well, then don't worry about it. You won't get it. This is not going to be hard today. <laughs> we are going to learn that we need to pray according to God's will. And you know, you can throw out, if it be your will, as much as you want to. I don't suggest doing that if it's like something you know for sure is in the Word of God. I don't think you need to pray, God, if it's your will, save my son. I think that's pretty obvious. But, you know, I just, I gave all that stuff up. I don't worry about that stuff anymore. I've got a relationship with God. I trust him. I believe he trusts me. I don't want anything he doesn't want me to have. And I'm going to pray like a wild, crazy woman for everything that I can think of. 
Amen? Because if there's anything that anybody can get, I'm going to get some of it. <laughs> Did you hear me? Well, who do you think you are? Nobody. And that's the beauty of it. Absolutely an undeserving, less than nothing, nobody. But when God does things for those nobodies, that's when we see his glory. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to think. Well, who do you think you are to pray like that? In James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What causes strife? Why do fights and feuds and quarrels, how do they originate among you? And many, many years ago, when God first began to give me revelation out of James 4, 1 and 2, I can tell you my life was full of strife, feuds, fights, and quarrels. Now, that's not the case now, but... When I saw that, what leads to strife, discord, and feuds, and how do quarrels and conflicts and fights originate among you, it had my interest. How many of you need a lot more peace in your life than what you experience? Have way too many fights and way too many quarrels and so much strife where you work and even strife in the church and strife in the home. And strife is bickering, arguing, heated disagreement, but it's also an angry undercurrent. And I hate that part worse than anything. It's like that angry undercurrent that can even be in the church among the people in the choir. <laughs> Come on. Well, I, I think I should be the worship leader. I can sing better. <laughs> she can't even sing her way out of a paper sack, and I've got a great voice. <laughs> Come on. Come on now. So he says, what, what's the cause of all this stuff? God's called us to peace. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. Wear your shoes of peace. He said, do they not arise from your sensual desires? So that's fleshly, carnal desires. It's, let's make it plain. It's stuff that we want. <laughs> it's a position. It's a promotion. It's finance. It's wanting what somebody else has. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you just hang on. It ain't time for that yet. <laughs> Verse 2, James 4, 2. In case you didn't hear him, he's wanting me to do the robot. I said, not yet. <laughs> I am sorry. It does not fit into the message today. <laughs> I'm doing half of this message this morning, the other half in the morning. If you want to see the robot, you will have to come back in the morning. So if it's worth it to you to change your plans and come over here just to see that, I'll do it. Okay, now watch this. You are jealous and you covet what other people have. Mm. And your desires go unfulfilled. So he's saying, you don't get what you want. You're not going to get it that way. So you become a murderer because to hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. Now let's talk about the gray area here for a minute. You say, well, I don't hate anybody. But do you love them? Well, no, I wouldn't exactly say that, but I don't really hate them. Well, you know, I don't see any other options in the Bible. It's like you burn with envy and anger and you're not able to get the gratification, the contentment, and the happiness that you seek. So before we read the answer, just look. He's saying, look, what causes all this upset in people's lives? Why can't people settle down and be content and be happy? It's because of all the stuff you want that you don't have. I mean, if you're unhappy today, isn't it about something you want that you don't have? <laughs> if this is too deep for you, we can go slow. <laughs> How many years was I unhappy because my ministry wasn't bigger than what it was? Lots of years. <laughs> you know what? We're on a journey. And life is not all just about the destination. It's more about the journey than anything else. And you need to learn to enjoy the journey. And that means that while I'm headed to what I think I want, God may actually do so much in my life that I'll realize by the time I get there, that's not even what I want. <laughs> oh, some of you sweet, beautiful, single ladies... You just got yourself convinced you just cannot be happy if you're not married. 
And some of you people have been married 30 years. You're convinced you cannot be happy if you have to stay married. <laughs> Let me enlighten you single people. You did not have to get anybody's permission to come here this morning. And not only that, you got up and you put on whatever you wanted to wear. Now, that did not happen to me today. I had a new outfit. And it was a little different for me. But I really liked it. And when I bought it, you should have seen the ladies in the shop that sold it to me. Now, normally you could say, well, they're just a salesperson. But this lady that sells me my clothes is my friend. And she said, oh, Joyce, that just looks so good on you. And my daughter was there. And she said, oh, that just looks so good on you. Mom, you got to get that. You got to get that. You got to get that. You got to wear that in the meeting. So I put it on this morning. And I went to Dave. And I said, so what do you think? And he said, I don't like it. Now, I mean, he wasn't even nice about it. He just liked with a, I don't like it. And then he said, I like, I really don't like it. He said, you look like you belong on the docks. Like you're a dock worker going down the docks to work. And I'm like, Dave. Well, my other friend was there, my assistant, and she's a little nicer. She said, well, she said, it just doesn't show off your little figure. I said, well, Dave, you could at least take a lesson from her if you're going to tell me you don't like my clothes. So actually, I have to carry extra clothes on the road just in case Dave don't like some of them. Now, honey, I want to tell you that from where I was to where I am took a lot of years. Because 40 years ago, I would have said, I don't care if you like it or not, it's what I'm wearing. That took a lot of prayer. <laughs> Amen? So, if you're single, you could be happy being single if you thought about the advantages. Now, I want to be married. I love being married. But I'm just saying that no matter what we have, unless we learn to be content with what God's giving us at the time... I said, unless we learn to be content with what God's giving us at the time... I love what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I've learned how to be content. And the Amplified Bible says, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed no matter what state I'm in. Now, he didn't say satisfied to the point where I never want to see change. See, you can want to see change. You can want things to be different in your life. You can want to get married someday, but you don't have to be unhappy every day until you are. Amen. Amen. Well, I got 10 reasons here and I'm not making much progress. <laughs> that first one took me 30 minutes. <laughs> you have not because you ask not. That's the answer to the whole mess. Why is there so much strife and quarreling and bickering and arguing? It's all the stuff you want. You don't get it. You see somebody that's got it. You get jealous and envious. You still don't end up with what you want. What's the problem? You have not because you ask not. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you, but when I read that many years ago, I tell you what, I was into so many works of the flesh. You know what works of the flesh are? It's us trying to do what only God can do. Can I tell you, if you're trying to change the person you're married to, it ain't going to work. <laughs> Won't work. You could humbly go to God, stressing humbly. You could humbly go to God and say, now, God, I know I got a lot of my own problems. And if I'm seeing this wrong, then just ignore me. But I'm asking you to change that. <laughs> our Henry, our Herbert, our Charlie, or if you're a guy here today, Mary Lou, Mary Jane, Janet, whatever. This is for all of us. We try to change our kids. And if you've got four, all four of them are totally different. We want them to be like us, and we don't even like who we are yet. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be a nightmare? 
if everybody in the whole house was like you. So I'm telling you, I just about killed myself in works of the flesh. And when I saw that scripture, oh, the joy of God hit my soul. You have not because you ask not. Now, there's a little bit of fear in that because then there's this thought, well, what if I want it, but God don't want me to have it? What if I want it, but God doesn't want me to have it? Maybe I better keep trying to get it myself in case he won't do it. <laughs> you know, we'll pray, but we always want a backup plan, don't we? Just in case God doesn't come through, we got kind of a backup plan, a plan B. Oh, you can never enjoy your life until you get out of works of the flesh. And learn that you have not because you ask not. And don't be afraid to ask God. He loves you. He wants to help you. You know, little kids ask for a lot of things that aren't good for them, and the parent just doesn't give it to them. <laughs> If God doesn't give you something you want, it's out of love. He's not holding out on you. He just knows something that you don't know yet. Come on now. Come on. Well, Lord, I tell you what, I want to marry that man. Well, maybe not so much, maybe. You know, if he's already been married four times, you better kind of consider that he was the only same thing in all the relationships God is able Ephesians 3 20 says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever dare to hope ask or think according to his power that works in us Jesus said ask you know sometimes if I need my prayer life or my faith in prayer bolstered I know where most of the scriptures are that say ask, and I will get them out and just read them. And I've got them all this morning, but I'm, I don't have time to put all these up. But the word ask means to request, to call for, to desire, and I love this part, to make a demand on what's already yours. God's already provided everything that we need. When I go to the bank and it's my money in the bank, I ask politely, but I'm really just making a demand on what's already mine. But you have not because you ask not. We can't assume and presume with God. I get his help when I humble myself and ask for his help. I can't just assume, well, if God wants to help me, he'll help me. The humble get the help. I ask God to help me. God, help me. And I don't know about you, but I need a lot of help getting through one day. God, help me get out of this bed and have a good attitude. Now, old Dave thought he was smart this morning, but he put something on the wheel, and he's got one coming back. <laughs> I get up in the mornings, and I'm, like, pretty quiet, you know. So I'm, I go over to the little kitchen at in the hotel here, and I'm making my coffee. And Dave comes around the corner, and I didn't hear him. And he goes, boo! And I went, ah! <laughs> Scared me half out of my wits. So how many of you think that he deserves... I, no, don't sing me no mercy songs right now. He deserves. I'm kidding. <laughs> Dave does the dishes a lot at night, and a few weeks ago he dribbled. He does this all the time. He dribbles Dawn Blue, Dawn dishwashing liquid, in the dishes and fills them full of water. So, you know, from the bubbly water, they got soap in them. But I went out one morning and grab my shaker glass that I make my nutrition drinks in and it didn't have any bubbly water in it and I didn't bother to look and I put my drink in there and shook it up and it, it had bubbles on it but it usually has some foam and I just thought boy there's this has really got a lot of bubbles today and I drank that right down and started gagging and spitting and do you think Dave apologized? No. You know what he did? He went around for the next hour singing, I'm forever blowing bubbles. <laughs> and I don't know where this thought came from, but early this morning, out of nowhere, I'd like to think it was a God idea, but it probably wasn't. I had this idea, just, I mean, out of nowhere. I was probably trying to pray, and here came this idea. <laughs> that I could make Dave a dessert 
and put shaving cream on the top of it. And it might look like whipped cream. But then I remembered I was coming to preach this morning, so I had to, I had to ditch that idea. Because revenge and the anointing don't go good together. <laughs> Man, we are off in Never Never Land here, aren't we? Okay, back to the business at hand. Don't ever be afraid to ask God for anything that you want or need. John 14, 12 through 14. John 15, 7 and 8. John 15, 16. <laughs> John 16, 23 and 24. John 16, 26 and 27. They all say, ask for whatever you need, and I'll do it. What wild promises. Now, obviously, you can't just pull one scripture out with having them all, and there are other scriptures that say we need to pray according to the will of God. So we want the whole counsel of the word of God, but I sure don't want you to be afraid that you're not going to pray in the will of God, so afraid that you don't pray. So I suggest that while you're learning to know more and more and more about God, that you just be bold and aggressive in your prayers, just saying to God, if it's not your will for me, don't give it to me. I don't want anything that you don't want me to have. If we could get to that point where we could say, God, I don't want anything you don't want me to have. You know, in John chapter 15, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and I'll do it. And I used to just shake my head at that. How could God say, you ask me for whatever you want and I'll do it? Because I already knew that some of the stuff I was asking for probably wasn't right. But see, there's a little secret there. He says, if you abide in me, and that means live, dwell, and remain. God has not called us to a Sunday morning visit. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. He doesn't want to live in the Sunday morning box in your heart. He wants to get into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. How you dress, what you eat, who you hang out with, what you watch on television. So that's kind of what it means to abide in him. If you abide in me, and then he says, if my word abides in you. So if I'm meditating on the word and I know the word and the word is my life. Well, sure, if I've got that kind of relationship with him and his words in me all the time, I'm not going to ask for anything that's not God's will. <laughs> So while you're on your way, while you're growing, don't be afraid to ask God. But if you don't get it, don't get upset. And don't be jealous of somebody else who has what you wanted because guess what? We all have an individual personalized plan with God for our lives. Hmm. And boy, tonight are we going to have fun. I don't even know if I should tell you what I'm going to preach on. Because there's always some people think, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> so no, I'm not going to tell you, but I just will tell you it's going to be really good. <laughs> so ask, ask, ask. And then in the Amplified Bible, and I love this, when it says, ask in my name, you know, we are to pray in Jesus' name, to the Father, through the Holy Spirit. When you say in Jesus' name, it's not like a little magic charm that we tack onto the end of all of our prayers. But when I say in Jesus' name, what I'm actually saying, Father, I'm presenting to you everything that Jesus is. That's the Amplified Translation. When you pray in my name, that is presenting all to the Father that Jesus is. So thank God we don't go and present what we are. We would never get anything. We pray in his name, in his name. So the first thing is, is we need to learn that we can... Pray anytime, anywhere. Learn to pray our way through the day. Prayer is a privilege, not an obligation. And we miss a great deal in life just because of a failure to get God involved in it. Open up the door and get God involved in everything just by asking him. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he will direct your path. Keep prayer simple. We're more likely to pray often if we believe it can be short and simple. Matthew 6, 7 says, and when you pray, don't heap up phrases, multiplying words, repeating the same ones over and over as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their much speaking. It's hard for the flesh to believe that a short, simple little prayer, Jesus, mommy, ouchie, <laughs> can be answered. Be sincere when you pray. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, and it's working. Realize that you're speaking to God when you pray and stay focused. Satan will try to distract you when you try to pray. 
Believe it or not, you can hide the cell phone. The world will not fall apart if you cannot be found. I promise you, if you cannot be found for 30 minutes, the world will not fall off its axis. And I don't know about you, but all the little dings and beeps and stuff, it's hard to ignore them. You got to at least go. Okay, here's another thing that's very important if you want your prayers to be answered. Don't hold a grudge against anybody. Now, some of you probably don't want to talk about this this morning, but we're going to anyway. Who are you mad at today? Hmm. I could ask how many of you are mad at somebody right now in your life, but you'd probably really rather that I wouldn't. <laughs> but maybe we should anyway, just to take the temperature in here. And you don't want to lie in the house of God. <laughs> How many of you right now in your life, you're mad at somebody? Well, that's about 75%. Okay, but now here's the thing I want you to understand. We can laugh about it, but you know what? It's not really funny. Because you know what? Staying mad at somebody is not going to change them one iota. But if you stay angry, it will change you. It'll make you bitter and give you a headache and make your stomach hurt. What does the Bible say in Ephesians 4? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil any such foothold in your life. If you give him a foothold, then he's likely to get a stronghold. You know, I had a situation with somebody last week, and I will not have strife in my life. I will not have strife in my life. I cannot have it. I cannot stand it. I, won't, I will not have it. And I do whatever I have to do to straighten it out. Now, there are situations that sometimes you can't straighten out with people, but you have to realize that you don't have to stay mad. No matter what they do, you don't have to stay mad. Come on now, I'm trying to help you. Because it does hinder prayer. Why do you think the devil works so hard to get us against each other? How many opportunities do you think you have every week to be offended? Oh my God. Oh Lord have mercy. No wonder the Bible says love is not touchy. Love is not easily offended. It's a great thing for a person to ignore an offense and say, I'm going to believe the best I'm not going to let the devil get me again. And of course, you know, then there's always a, well, you don't know what's happened to me in my life. Well, no, you're, you're right. I don't, but I do know what happened to me. And I know what's happened to a lot of other people. And I do know what the Bible says. And everything that God tells us is for us. It's not for anybody else. It's for us. <laughs> Holding a grudge against someone will definitely affect prayer and not in a good way. Matthew 6:14 says for if you forgive people their trespasses their reckless and willful sins. So these are not even things that they did accidentally. He's saying even if somebody hurt you on purpose, they willfully hurt you. You leave the situation, let it go, give up the resentment. <laughs> and can I just say that when you're angry with somebody, the quicker you let it go, the easier it is to do. Always do it before it has time to get down inside you and take root. And then your heavenly father will also forgive you. You see, the one important thing about prayer, when we go to God, we've got to have confidence that there's nothing between us and God to the best of our knowledge. Something that I suggest doing is at night when you lay down, just ask yourself before you go to sleep, am I mad at anybody? God, am I mad at anybody? If you fall asleep too fast, when you wake up the next morning, ask yourself, now, God, am I mad at anybody? Get to the point where you refuse to go, to go to sleep or to go out of your house mad at anybody. <laughs> patty cake, patty cake, patty cake. <laughs> well, you just don't know how hard it is. Yeah, I, actually, I really do. I really do know. I really do. But here's what I also know. God didn't give us the power of the Holy Spirit so we could just do easy stuff. Come on. He gave us his power so we could do his will. And we can do whatever 
God asks us to do through Christ who is our strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One more scripture here. Matthew 11, 24 through 26. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Now that, you know, man, that's about a four-part series right there. So what's he saying? You ask for it, you believe in the spirit that you got it, and then you will get it. You see that? First comes faith, then comes sight. First you believe, then you see. In our society, we say, well, I'm not going to believe it if I don't see it. But in God's economy, we have to learn how to live the exact opposite. If it's in the Word, if it's the will of God, if I ask God for it, I believe that He's sending it and that I will get it, and I'm going to stay firm in my faith until I see that manifestation. This is what faith is. Faith is a title deed, the proof of the things that we do not see that we hope to obtain. And we have it first by faith. Dave and I signed a contract last week with an architect who's going to design something for us, and we made a down payment. Now, I fully, without any doubt, expect that woman to come up with the plans. But I haven't seen them. I haven't even seen her work. I've heard about her reputation. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is our down payment, the Bible says. Come on. The Holy Spirit, just that, yeah. You know, you're sitting out here today, maybe you've never heard anything like this. But boy, it feels good inside. You're like, man, could I dare believe this? That I could have that kind of power in my life. That I could go to God Almighty and ask Him for anything and everything. And He cares enough about me that He wants to get involved in my life. Can I dare believe that? The down payment of the Holy Spirit is that little thing floating around inside of you that in your heart is saying, yes, yes, even though your head might be saying, no, no. I'd say the first time I went into a service like this where people were clapping and shouting and cheering and jumping up and down, I mean, everything in my legalistic, indoctrinated religious brain said, oh. <laughs> I mean, I even looked, and one guy was walking around, had no shoes on. And I thought, <laughs> he is barefoot. <laughs> now, I'm still not real fond of that in church, but, you know, God did tell Moses to take his shoes off, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, give me a break. We think that somebody can't be from God if they've got a tattoo. We think somebody can't be from God if they don't have the right hairstyle. We think somebody can't be from God. And a lot of times we're so busy trying to clean the fish, we haven't even caught it yet. Me and a friend of mine who was a, who's a real, true evangelist, we went into this shop one day to shop, and the lady said, what are you doing here? And we said, well, we're here for, you know, a Christian Bible seminar. And she said, oh, I'm spiritual too. Well, you know, I'm, you know when somebody says that, you're kind of like, mm, well, what does that mean? I'm spiritual too. <laughs> so we didn't, you know, we didn't get into that too much. But then she, she proceeds to talk about God for a little bit and her version of God, and then all of a sudden, she blurts out this real pretty serious cuss word. I mean, you know, it was like one of the big ones. <laughs> Even that, we've divided up into big and little. <laughs> you know how it is. It's the S word and the this word and the some other word. And uh, <laughs> like God has no clue what we're talking about. Anyway, she did one of the big ones. And, uh, you know, of course, I was a little, but the evangelist just leaned in. <laughs> and uh, so then this girl, this spiritual girl, 
She said, oh, I'm sorry I cussed. But she said, you know what? I think God cusses once in a while. <laughs> okay, see, you're like I was. <laughs> you're not ready to fish yet. And so I leaned right across that counter. And I said, God does not cuss. I'm defending God's honor. God does not cuss. And my evangelist friend slips around on this side and leans in and she says, but he sure loves people that do. Yeah. And I realized later I was trying to clean that fish and we hadn't even caught it yet. Man, I've gone off onto so many side roads here today. I don't know. <laughs> you know, we get all kinds of stuff, grudges in our heart toward people. Well, you couldn't possibly because your hair is... <laughs> I have a beautiful granddaughter whose hair goes from blue to purple to... <laughs> she did green one time. And I am like... And then God started leading us to have all these updated younger people in our music and our bands. And man, sometimes our hair is going in 40 directions. And I mean, Martin Smith used to lead worship for us and he traveled with us with Delirious. And I mean, you know, his hair would be, and he told me one time it took him like 45 minutes to get that look. And I'm like, well, I had that when I got up. I need to work on that. I get that naturally. <laughs> it's so good for us to learn to stop getting our nose out of joint if everybody's not like us. If they don't look like us and smell like us and talk like us and dress like us and worship like us. And there are so many grudges in the body of Christ at large. Come on, you know, this denomination don't like that denomination. That denomination don't like this denomination. <laughs> you know, there's probably even some churches in town. I don't know, maybe it doesn't happen everywhere, but somewhere where maybe, you know, the church was told, don't you go to that Joyce Meyer meeting. Because, <laughs> you know, she is whatever I am. <laughs> and that's such a shame when we do that. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that it's granted to you, and you will get it. When I walked into that first meeting that was kind of similar to this, my religious brain was going, no way. But my heart was like, yes, yes, yes. That confirmation you have in your heart that God is working and that you will see some. Can I tell you something? Whatever kind of problem you've got now, I don't care what it is, and you hold on to this, it's going to work out okay in the end. it's all going to come around and be right. In the end. You know, there's so much stuff going on in the world today, and people ask me frequently as a minister, well, what do you think about what's going on in the world? And, you know, sometimes you don't know what to think, and I'm certainly not going to live in fear. I believe God's going to take care of us. And, but I was reading Psalm 37 a month or so ago, and it says so plainly, do not fret yourself over the evildoers. <laughs> For they will soon be cut down like the grass. The meek in the end will inherit the earth. In the end. Amen. And the good news is, is we already know how it ends because we've got the book. Man, we've been from Genesis to Revelation today. <laughs> so don't let all those grudges stay in your heart. Angry about this, angry about that, angry about something else. Don't hide sin in your heart and expect your prayers to be powerful. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 1 John 1, 9, but if we freely admit that we've sinned and confess our sins, which basically means just to acknowledge them, to agree with God. This morning when the Holy Spirit prompted me that putting shaving cream on Dave's dessert was not a good idea, <laughs> I agreed with him. That probably would not be a good idea. <laughs> 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 
How many of you know some of the stuff you come up with, you've already got that little inkling, this ain't a good idea? Some of you even got married knowing this ain't a good idea. <laughs> Lord, help us. He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I love 1 John 2, 4. You have to look at this. My little children, I write all of these things to you that you may not sin. This is the whole purpose of the book. Don't live in sin. Don't hide your sin. Bring it out in the open because the only things that the devil can hold over you are the things that are hidden in darkness. I don't know, man, if you used to be a prostitute and you're hiding that because of fear of what everybody would think, find somebody you can trust and tell it. If you can't tell anybody else, write me and tell me. But the only things that the enemy can hold over us are things that we hide. But if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. I stood in the pulpit last Sunday at our church in St. Louis. We've got a church in the inner city. Beautiful church. I only get to preach there a handful of times a year, but... I stood in the pulpit and told them how I used to be a thief and a liar. And see, they responded about the way you are. <laughs> like, well. <laughs> what am I supposed, how do I process that information? Because that person who did that is dead. And I'm a new creature in Christ. Come on, you want to talk about some of the stuff you did? <laughs> but see, it does not bother me one iota to stand up here and not only tell you that, but now the whole world knows it. Or everybody who's listening, it's not the whole world, but whoever's out there that's listening, now they know. But you notice I said, I used to be. I once was. You know, the person who was sexually abused by her father for 15 years died in Christ. That's why I can't be a victim of anything. You cannot be a victim when you've got the victory. When I talk about that girl, that's like somebody I used to know way, way long time ago. And see, that's part of the problem we have is people don't know how to let go of the old and take hold of the new. First John 2, for my little children, I write you these things that you may not violate God's law and sin. <laughs> I love this. But if anyone should sin, we have an advocate, one who will intercede for us with the Father. And that's Jesus Christ, the all-righteous, who conforms to the Father's will in every purpose, thought, and action. It almost sounds to me like he's saying, you know what? It's so easy to take care of sin that it really doesn't have to be a major problem. Get up every day and do your best not to sin. That's our goal. You didn't come here this morning because you're intent on sinning. And so therefore, I can boldly say to you, when you do, you don't have to worry about it. You do need to acknowledge it. But here's the good news, too. Hey, if you die and you forget to confess some stuff, that's not going to keep you out of heaven. God knows your heart. But when the Holy Spirit does convict you of something, then that's the time to say, God, you're right. Don't ever argue with God. It is pointless. <laughs> he always wins. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Doubt. Hmm. We better save that for tomorrow. <laughs> oh, we got some good stuff tomorrow. But I'm not going to tell you about tonight. How to we're going to talk tomorrow about how to handle doubt. Ooh, just because the devil comes knocking on your door, that don't mean you have to let him in. 
Mm. So good. Pride. We're going to talk about pride tomorrow. Mm. Selfishness. Ooh. That's when we'll be able to do the robot. <laughs> Not having love in your life. Mm. Wow. A little more strife right there. Laziness. Refusal to do our part. How many of you think I can't do eight points tomorrow in one hour? <laughs> Come on, God loves you. And you have the great privilege of talking personally to the God of all creation. That's what prayer is. It's talking to God. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray for all the people here that they would just thoroughly soak this up and not have any fear concerning their prayer life and just keep it simple and focused and sincere and help us God to keep the strife and the anger out of our lives and all the other things you're teaching us and I pray that everybody would have a safe wonderful joy-filled afternoon in Jesus name amen God bless you guys